Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome to the Form Book Club. We are back discussing on the box book, The Church, Paradox and Mystery. We left off around page 90 in the chapter on uh, Lumen Gentium and the Fathers of the Church. This is sort of the last, whenever there's three little stars there, asterisks, you know, that means that it's a, it's a section change in, in French topography. And so this is sort of the end of this chapter on the fathers of the church in Lumen Gentium, and especially it had to do with the role of Mary in Lumen Gentium. And uh, he says on page 90, a new paragraph there, in conclusion, let us return to the typology, in quotes, that is how different realities are types or models or archetypes of other things. These bonds of mystical analogy between Mary and the church are just as vividly perceived in our age as they must have been in the time of Ambrose and Augustine. So he's going to conclude it. He's shown how the fathers of the church gave a certain priority to this connection between Mary uh, and the church. And he's going to show that's still current. Uh, and he, he, list, he lists four contemporary writers. And... Uh, Vivian and Joseph, you're going to have to interrupt me anytime you want because uh, I'm going to be reminiscing and uh, wandering with my historical memories as I go through these four authors. So page 91, Hans-Jos von Balthasar is one who often throws into relief what he calls the Marian dimension of the church. And he mentions three, three works, Heart of the World, Prayer, in Theology of History. And I think last time, Vivian, you mentioned reading prayer and how impressed you were by that book. So I do think we probably discussed Balthazar last time. The next person he mentions is Paul Claudel. Now, Paul Claudel is a French poet and writer and novelist. And one of the things Balthazar did was translate Claudel into German and make Claudel very popular in Germany. The third person he mentions here on page 93 is Father Teilhard de Chardin. Now, I am of an age where I can recall vividly that Teilhard de Chardin was seen on the one hand by some people as the Antichrist, and on the other hand by other people as the Messiah. Uh, and I believe neither of those caricatures were true. He was basically an archaeologist, a scientist, who also had a deep philosophical, theological background in, in, in education. And he was doing what he thought his best was, well, it was his best, I presume, uh, to show that uh, science and faith are not at odds with each other. This was in the middle of the 20th century and early, early 20th century, where, of course, Darwin and Darwinism had such an influence, and Teilhard was trying to show that, no, there, there's, a, there's a connection here. Uh, there's truth, a single truth, which is expressed in two modes by science, including biology, including evolution, and theology. The Lubach was a personal friend of Teilhard's. They were both French Jesuits. And in 1947 or 48, when de Lubac was told no longer to write uh, because of a controversy on a book he wrote on Nature and Grace, he was eventually uh, allowed to write again, but his provincial wanted him to defend Teilhard. And so de, de Lubac actually wrote four or five books on Teilhard de Chardin, in which he recognizes erroneous statements by Teilhard, areas where Teilhard you know, went off track, but shows the fundamental uh, Catholicity and intellectual integrity of Teilhard de Chardin. So that's one reason why you'll see here the Lubac referring several times in this book to Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, finally, 
more memories on page 94, middle, the new paragraph in the middle, he says, to this triple witness, we'll add another precursor, l'abbé Jules Monchonin. Who was Jules Monchonin? Father Monchonin, Abbé, he was basically a pastor, a parish priest. He was uh, in Lyons, Lyon, when Father de Lubac, as a young Jesuit priest in 1931 or so, was assigned to the theological faculty there. And Pius XI had just written that all seminarians should have some understanding of Eastern religions. It's important for a Catholic priest to have some knowledge of these very important religious traditions in the world. And since de Lubac was the youngest faculty member and no one knew anything about these religions, they assigned it to him. Well, it turned out that Father Monchonin uh, was the, a great, uh, what do you call this, uh, orientophile or something like that. He, uh, he, he was very well read in Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, and so on, Taoism. And he had the best library in Europe on Eastern religions. And so de Lubac had to know him well. And on the basis of his studies that he did in Moshinez Library, uh, he, he wrote three books uh, on Buddhism uh, in the 1950s, early 50s. And of course, prior to that, he taught the courses at the seminary. Now, why is this important to me? Well, first of all, I think, Vivian, we've talked about this. We probably should uh, translate a couple of those books or get them back into print because they're still valuable books. But uh, when I was teaching as a young scholastic, uh, before I went to France for theology, teaching philosophy, I would get, this is in the 60s, it was hippie time, right? I always get this, uh, this criticism, oh, well, uh, Mr. Fessio, uh, you, uh, you're thinking in Aristotelian terms, but the world doesn't think that way. This idea of non-contradiction, that's a Western thought. They didn't talk about white supremacy then or patriarchy. It was just, this is, you know, Western colonialism. And I knew it wasn't true, but it's hard to convince me. I decided when I got to France that I was going to travel to India. And so I talked to Father Lubac, and he said, why don't you visit Father Monchonin? Because Father Monchonin, he loved the uh, Eastern religions so much for what they did that was valuable. He thought that his view was they will never convert to Christianity unless we show them we have a mystical tradition because they're very mystical. So Abhi Moshinan actually went to uh, Tamil Nadu, which is the southern part of India, in Tiruchirappalli, uh, one of the provinces there, a city, and he found that a monastery called Satchidananda. Uh, I think, I think Satcha means wisdom and D means a word and Nanda means spirit or something like that. Uh, and so it's actually a Trinitarian thing, Father, Son, Spirit, but Satchidananda, ashram. And so I... Uh, by that time, in 1969 and 1970, uh, Father Moshin had passed away, died, and the monastery was, was run by uh, Dom Bede Griffiths, whose name means something to you, uh, uh, Joseph, The Golden Thread, I think it was his book on C.S. Lewis. So anyway, uh, I uh, got a little two-cylinder French car with two other judges. We I put a bed in the back. And we drove to India, and I spent a month at Satsadinda Ashram, which is founded by Abhimu Shanan. So that has nothing to do with the content of this book, except for the fact that I want to tell my story about Abhimu Shanan. But so, Father, oh. didn't, didn't you discover on that trip to India that indeed they do believe in the law of oh, contradiction? Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I came back and taught him. I said, I've been there, folks, and I can tell you, uh, Aristotle's laws of logic and, and the mind are universal truths about human nature, whether it's East or West. Absolutely. Well, I must confess a rather bizarre and irreverent uh, parallel that came to my mind uh, when you said that you, this is 1969, 1970, is that there's a parallel in the life of Father Joseph Fezio with the Beatles, who also went off to India for enlightenment at that time. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, if I could play the guitar, the guitar I might be famous. But father wasn't taking LSD, and that makes all the difference. Oh, that's true. That's difference the world, yeah. <laughs> Next time. No, no, <laughs> please do not. 
So any other comments from the two of you on this uh, chapter on Lumen Gentium and the Fathers of the Church? Well, well this section... Sorry, sorry, Vivian, you please. No, you go first, Joseph. Well, I was, I, I, I had, the only place that things I had highlighted in the in the section you just covered uh, were the two quotes from Bon Balthasar about Mary, which I think we covered, page 91, which I, you know, Mary is considered the, at, at length as the archetype of Christian contemplation. And then her, uh, the church said the perfect, Mary uh, said the perfect yes, that is the origin and substance of all Christian contemplation. I think those two are very profound statements. And then I did quote, uh, highlight a bit about Paul Clodell, but I think you've already covered that. So that's all I really want to say in this chapter. I just wanted to point out a couple things. One, this idea of the eternal feminine, that Teilhard de Chardin has this entire poem. or uh, yes. And I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, we wrote, we published a book called The Eternal Woman by Gertrude von Lefort. Right. And that is definitely worth reading for anyone who wants to consider further what this is all about. Uh, I also wanted to point out in the, the middle of the poem that's quoted on the bottom of 93, where Chardin's poem says, only love has the power to move being. That, you know, was really the essence of Maximilian Kolbe's spirituality, that only love is creative power. That's the only creative power. So when you see these different great people converging on this, on looking at the same thing, you know, De, che, De, Tehard de Chardin and Maximilian Kolbe and Gertrude von Lefort and Hansers von Balthasar and Paul Claudel and, you know, they're all seeing and talking about the same reality, even if it might come out a bit differently. Well, and also, um, also both Gertrude von Lefort and Terre de Chardin uh, were re re reprising a theme of Goethe, das ewig weibliche, das zieht uns heran, the, the eternal feminine that draws us up. So now, it may have existed in that expression even before Goethe, but his expression is the one that led both Goethe von Lefort and Herr de Chardin to expound on this theme. Yes. And then I also noticed that because he ends, uh, uh, that is uh, Father de Lubach, ends this chapter uh, bringing together the, the people of God, image of the church, with the daughter Zion image of the people of God prior to Christ, Mary, and the church. So that, you know how he started this whole section on the church showing that these different images of the church, even though one can be emphasized at some point or another, they're not in contradiction with each other. They ha that you have to keep them all together and see how they belong together. And I think he brilliantly demonstrates on the last page of his chapter what he set out to talk about at the beginning of the book um, with these images of the church. Uh, even if they get different emphases, they're not in contradiction. Yeah, I think one thing as well as regards facets, uh, that these different ways of seeing the church, they're facets they're not necessarily the whole thing so for instance we can talk about mary being mother of the church we can talk about mary being the church but we can't talk about the church being the mother of god right that's something which belongs to mary but not to the church so in other words these offer expressions and facets but they're not necessarily taken individually entireties that are that are that are true in all facets they're offering uh, one aspect of our understanding that's right. And there's also a dynamic connection between what you mentioned uh, and Dulbach did, Vivian, about people of God marry the church. I mean, you've got the people of God, which converges onto a spear point, as Lewis will say in Miracles, which is Mary. And, and she is the arch representative of the people of God. 
And then from her comes the new people of God, which is no longer just a, an ethnic group or a group united by a common faith, but actually becomes one with Christ through her uh, as one body and one bride. Uh, on to chapter 4, the pagan religions and the fathers of the church. I want to put a little preamble here because uh, it'll become explicit in this chapter, but it's implied at the very beginning. Uh, why does he want to talk about pagan religions? Because at around the time of the council before, during, and after, there was this concept of uh, uh, the world from its creation being a graced reality. Uh, and there's both truth and error involved in that expression, which means it has to be uh, refined. But one of the errors was that, well, if, if, God, if, if God's intent is that we live with him as one in Jesus Christ, who was before the foundation of the world, well, then everybody's a Christian, at least implicitly. And so there's this whole anonymous, what they call anonymous Christianity, that everybody really is already redeemed and is already in grace, and Christ only comes to reveal to us what already exists. That was the error, and we'll see how Delubach responds to that error in this chapter on the pagan religions and the fathers of the church. Well, I found uh, this, uh, I found this a particularly uh, enjoyable chapter and a very illuminating chapter because, you know, I, I was deeply moved. I mean, the whole idea in my conversion of, of, of faith and reason being indissolubly wedded and therefore, you know, the understanding that the church uh, acquired some of this understanding of reason from the Greek philosophers. Um, uh, and then C.S. Lewis, when he talks about in the Pilgrim's Regress that, that only the Jews continue to know how to read but but uh, but God did not abandon those who had forgotten the law and how to write it. He sent them pictures, um, and therefore we have not just, uh, if you like, the pictures we might get through reason, but the pictures we might get through art and story. So what I love about this chapter is the way that Delubach gives uh, one saint after another, um, quoting various aspects of this understanding of, if you like, the the old covenant small c that the Gentiles had with Christ, obviously without knowing him. Did you want to refer to any particular text or just make yeah, that yeah, comment? There are, there are a few. On page 98, according to Justin, mankind before Christian revelation received seeds of the Logos and thus could partially understand the truth that would be fully manifest in Christ. So obviously to fully understand God, we need revelation. But prior to that, there are these seeds of the Logos that are planted. And the quote is, for whatever either lawgivers or philosophers uttered well, they elaborated by finding and contemplating some part of the word. So there's some aspect of a knowledge of God that's implicit in the, the use of reason, uh, and the, the, the creation of beauty. Um, so uh, that's one example. And then Clement of Alexandria, the same page, uh, a, the, he calls philosophy a science pervaded by piety. And again, you know, I love that. It's sort of the idea from uh, Aquinas and obviously others that to actually come to the truth, you have to have that wonder, which is a fruit of humility. So in other words, to actually engage with the true, you have to be humble. Therefore, there is a there is a definite connection between philosophy and piety, at least philosophy that, that attains to the truth, and piety and virtue. And there are well, others, I but I think we'll hold the conversation. Well, it's it's just a very, very good chapter. Yes, I thought you would like this chapter, Joseph. Uh, I like it also, and I like the way Delubach sums up your point on the top of 99 by the illuminating action of the Logos destined for incarnation. Mankind came to know a certain number of essential truths that were in agreement with the Christian faith or could serve as a preparation for it. 
Exactly. And I mean, we see this obviously not just in the philosophy of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, but I think it's there are there's certainly a grappling and a groping after this understanding of truth in great works of beauty such as Homer and Sophocles as well. So I think we see this movement, this desire for the fullness of revelation uh, in sort of embryonic form prior to the coming of Christ. And then Christ, then that's why, I mean, St. Paul found uh, the, 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 the pagans more receptive to the word of God than his own Jewish people. And, and it's because I think this groundwork, if you like, that, that God had himself providentially planted the seeds in terms of philosophy and, and beauty uh, so that they were also ripe for the picking, so to speak, at the preordained moment of incarnation. And here is the very important theological point, which we'll be discussing throughout this chapter. Uh, is this logos spermatic cost, the seeds of the word, is that simply something in creation which is part of creation? Or is that somehow already grace? That is to say, is grace beyond creation, present in creation, prior to the historical incarnation of Christ. And uh, I will say the answer to that, along with the Dubach, Balthasar, many of the fathers of the church and others, and St. Paul, when Colossians 1 and Ephesians 1 makes it clear that all things are created in Christ. Before the foundation of the world created in Christ. So how can it be that not the Logos only before creation, but the incarnate Logos, Jesus Christ, historically in time, how can he be said to be before the founding of the world? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get deeper into that, but that, that's a theological, deeply profound, well, I guess that's a, you know, a tautology there. Um, but a very profound mystery, which will never fully way, grasp. Go ahead. In the way that I, so yeah, the way I would, I would uh, sort of uh, uh, agree with that is the words of Hopkins. If I look at that window, is almost doing at the trees there, you know that the, the, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. No, and the oak trees after Christ were not charged with the grandeur of God in a way that the oak trees before the time of Christ were charged with the grandeur of God. In other words, there's something in God's creation which is charged with his grandeur. And that charging with his grandeur is in some sense grace. Well, in some sense grace. But then my question is, what is grace other than a participation in divine human life of Jesus Christ. Is there any, is this the thing as grace, which is not a participation in the incarnate son? No, there isn't. Uh, but, so, but before Christ reveals himself uh, through his incarnation, life, death, resurrection, etc., he's present in creation. And that presence in creation is a gift, uh, which has the power to lead us closer to him. So there, there is a, there is a something which is graceful about it. And again, one thing about all of this, seeing things prior to Christ as being, if you like, premonitions of him, the middle of page 99, Eusebius of Caesarea says, this is, this is evangelical preparation. In other words, the purpose of that which precedes Christ is to prepare us for Christ. Yes, but you just said that... Uh... Christ, you said he is present in the, in the world before the incarnation. But if the as he the, is Christ... As, as, as the son, as the se second person in the Trinity he is. No, no, no. The, the, the second person incarnate is present. Not just the second person, the Logos, the Word. Well, I mean, pro but prior to the incarnation, the second person is present in the cosmos. Incarnate. That is to say, Jesus Christ is present prior to the Incarnation. That's the mystery. It's trans-historical. It's like, you know, it's like... How so, is, Father, yeah. you're saying... I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying that well, the man, the man, Jesus, 
who is the incarnate word of God made flesh, is present before the foundation of the world. The, 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 the man Jesus is. Well, there's only one Jesus Christ, right? He's God and man, both, right? We're when we say Jesus Christ, we're talking about the word of God incarnate, the man, Jesus, who is fully God. Right. Well, if you read Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, you will see that all things were created in him before the foundation. Well, I mean, how did they create it in him before the foundation of the world? In him means in Jesus Christ. Oh, I, I thought that just meant in the word, you know, that God yeah. creates. Go, go back and reread it very carefully, both Colossians well, he, and Ephesians. Well, you know what, what this was. reminds me of? It, it's sort of childish, but you know how some of these paintings of the Annunciation will show the little man-child coming down through the, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's so cartoonish and cute at the same time that you know the, that the words of the angel and on this these beams of radiant glory comes the little man-child. That that's what I'm thinking of. I mean, I I, it's silly, but uh, it's hard to grasp what you're saying. It Let's is, just it say is that very hard to grasp. And see, comprehenderis non estes. If you've understood, it's not God. I mean, that's what Augustine says. And I, it's part no. of it's part of necessary dialectical or paradoxical thinking uh, that we have to take seriously what. Paul says in Ephesians and, and Colossians, it's said by the fathers and elsewhere too. But that, what about this idea of Jesus actually taking flesh from Mary? In other words, if if his body, if his physical body is taking flesh in the womb of Mary, then how did that exist before Beforehand, it, it didn't exist well, I mean, historically before, but ontologically, transhistorically before. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that I try to make sense of this is that um, the the God's omnipresence means that all time is present to Him, so that um, that we can't speak about Moses. I mean, Moses once was. Some says Moses is and is in terms of God's presence, Shakespeare, us. Um, and so, so in other words, there, there is this sense in which history is, um, uh, what is what's the said it called? Let's say uh, some timeless moments uh, that, that England is and now or something. Uh, England was and now. I'm, I'm garbling T.S. Eliot here, Mayor Cooper. Um, but, uh, but I mean, Eliot has inklings of that in four quartets, that, that history basically is played out in God's presence, that there's not, um, in that sense, we can't talk about um, Jesus Christ not existing uh, in his fullness prior to his physical inclination in time, because he it would have all been present to him prior to his incarnation in time. I think that gets close to it, yes. And I think, uh, well, this, go ahead, Vivian. Well, the other thing that gets close to it is E equals MC squared. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this, is the, this is the thing that always gets me. I mean, say that we our, our physical bodies are not raised, you know, until the end of time. You know, when we die, does that mean that we are rotting in our graves for uh, 500,000 years? You know, when we die, we enter that eternity, which is beyond time, and it's, it's all going to be simultaneous. So, you know, that's an example, really, of, you know, we don't hang around, right? We've left. <laughs> We've gone somewhere else. And that somewhere else is somewhere where, where God is, the whole of history is present to him. But, it, but again, arguing against myself now, uh, we have to be careful of Gnosticism or this kind of spiritualism in which history has no meaning. You know, it's all swallowed up into this eternal moment, and therefore there's no such thing as succession in time. But you got all both together. But I think this is a good preparation. Uh, we've whetted people's appetites so that we'll come back uh, next week and delve more deeply into this very topic, which the Lubach covers in this chapter. Amen? Amen, <laughs> as they say.
All right. Thanks, everybody. God bless you. See you next week. If you enjoyed this discussion, please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.